Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Today, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Or uh, come and give us a talk on about attacking Kasumi. Uh, as you all know, Or is a very well-known crypto analyst and is a student of LAB Ham and has broken every symmetric crypto system in sight, including uh, you know, AES, uh, IDEA, and now Keylock. Uh, and now, now today, he'll attack Kasumi. All is a pleasure. Thank you very much. OK. Um... So I'm going to discuss a practical time related key attack on Kasumi, which is a block cipher used in the 3G networks and in GSM networks actually as well. And this is joint work with Nathan Keller and Adi Shamir, who will correct me if I make any mistakes around, <laughs> uh, which is very expected. So roughly going over what we're going to have, first of all, a bit about GSM and 3G standards. Um, I'm not a GSM slash 3G standard. Uh, expert, so if I say something that contradicts the specs or your knowledge, you're probably right. This is just guessing from, I will discuss this issue in a second. Um, sometimes both of us can be right. I mean, what I'm saying and what you know can be right because there are so many standards running around in this world. You're going to describe some of our communication with those organizations? Uh, no, I will just speak about it. I don't want to put it on slides, uh, especially if they're going to be broadcasted to the whole world. Uh, then a bit about the boomerang attack, uh, what's differential cryptanalysis is, so sort of 101 introduction to cryptanalysis, and then the boomerang attack, which is an improved or more generalized approach. A bit about the ind independence assumptions needed in differential cryptanalysis and boomerang attacks, and actually, to some extent, our new result can be shown, ca can be summarized as sometimes there is dependence and we can use it for our advantage. So if there is one slogan that you can take with you home today, besides Kasumi is broken, is that independence might help you. I will discuss the sandwich attack, and I will show you the new attack on Kasumi, and we will conclude the talk. OK, so 3G GSM, more than 3 billion users around the world use today mobile phones which are either in 3G or GSM, and it's actually used in 212 countries, which is more countries than the UN has, just to give you the indication of where we're standing. Exactly. Yeah, that's... Now, it has an inherent support for roaming, so if you cross the border here to Canada, you can start, you can continue speaking, even though it would cost you the arm and leg, because Rogers takes quite a lot of money. And it has actually GSM, which is the second generation communication, has four, bandwidth, uh, four bands, 900 and 1800 in all civilized world besides North America and Chile, and 850, 1900 in North America and Chile, due to historical political reasons, nothing to do with real issues. The 3G networks use 1700 uh, and 2100, Surprisingly enough, this is for downlink, this is for uplink. Oh. So they just changed the model completely. You will see it in a second. Now, again, there is a chance I'm contradicting myself. The problem is that half of the documents about 3G, and just to give you some indication about the protocols around here, there is GSM, which is second generation. There is GPRS, which is the GSM approach to send. It's a gen general packet radio service which is the second and a half generation. Then there is 3G and UMTS, which is the Universal Mobile Telecommunica Telecommunication System. And then there is the high speed data something something, which is three and a half. And soon we're going to have 4G, which is again UMTS. So just to confuse the use, there is G GSM 2.9 and GSM 3.9, and there is 3.99 and 3.95. So probably under one of the specs, I'm right. OK, just to give you some indication about the speeds uh, related to it, in GSM, voice is encoded either in 6.5 kilobits per second or 13 kilobits per second. This is the outcome of the encoder. Um, the data in GPRS can reach 144 kilobits per second. 
which is nice. It's sufficient uh, if you don't do much uh, on the network. And the speeds is actually the same uplink and downlink. And the same 3G, they will improve the low quality of the voice. And of course, they will reduce the high quality of the voice in exchange. Sort of karma thing. You have to balance everything all the time. And you can reach up to 2 megabits per second. And 3.5, and I think you can reach 21 megabits per second. And so far, everything is symmetric. When you get to the fourth generation, it's going to be for the first time asymmetric, where you will be able to download faster than you upload. And I'm thinking about the fact that users, most of the time, want to consume information, not to generate and share information. When you want 100 megabits per second on your cellular phone, you want to watch 10 movies at the same time? Or? You're going to connect it to your laptop. And when you're going to. You can connect up to eight laptops to me. And then you will connect this laptop to the cloud, and it will start running secure multi-party computation protocols <laughs> and location-based services. <laughs> yeah. And most of it is, of course, going to be protected and secured with various mechanisms. Now, I'm sorry, the asymmetry is not, uh, doesn't have to do with sort of basic technical limitations like the powers of the transmitters versus the power of the phone? Uh, it's mostly, in theory, you could increase the battery size by a factor of two, and it should still work. Right, it, it's a matter of just, we don't have enough bandwidth. Currently, most service providers, mobile, uh, mobile service providers, have an issue with lack of bandwidth to their base stations. This is currently the inhibitive factor in many cases. And in the future, it's going to, to be even worse. So God knows why they want to give you more megabits per second between you and the base station when they cannot push enough information to the base station as it is. We're, we're thinking small. The form factor may become a virtual reality helmet. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't we let him continue? <laughs> well, I, I have the feeling that at the end, this is going to be the case. Nobody would ever go outside his house. And I mean, <laughs> good for your muscle. OK, so let's consider, for example, this lovely thing, handheld device. And it has to have security. So what are the most interesting security threats, call theft? Uh, old analog phones and old generation protocols had quite a lot of issues with call theft or cell phone duplication, where you just leave me the phone for a few seconds. I read all the information from it, and now I can make phone calls and charge your account rather than mine. Also, there is the issue of eavesdropping, and today we have way more issues, and today there are even viruses for mobile phones and that sort of stuff. Uh, please go to visit, visit my website using your new third generation mobile phone. Very cool viruses. Uh, seriously, though, the GSM 3. Yes, this is an example for uh, how to use the fact that you have 100 megabits per second per download. I mean, if you want to break stuff, it's important. Now, the model is very simple because we have a service provider and we have customers, so we can have pre shared secrets. And to, incorporate, to deal with all these issues, there is a SIM card inside each mobile phone which works in GSM or 3G, which contains a series of pre-shared secrets. And that's it. That's the only source of security and the fact that they used proprietary algorithms. It gives you this warm, fuzzy feeling that it's going to be secure. OK. So what are the protocols? First of all, you have to authenticate your mobile phone to the network. And there are two protocols, A3 and A8, which are actually not defined. A3 and A8 are carrier protocols. And they are defined to be, I send to the mobile phone query of this and this many bits. I get a response of this and this many bits. I, do, I send again this and this many bits. I get this and this many bits. And at the end of this process, I know that the mobile phone at the other side is indeed one of the mobile phones that I authorized actually one of the SIM cards that I authorized. And by the way, we also have a shared key. This is a byproduct of all this authentication protocol. Um, and the end of this execution, you get either 64 bits of a key in uh, GSM and A53. And in the future, you'll get 128 bits. And this is also what you get in 3G networks. 128 bits of shared key based on 100. Out of the 64 bits, you get 10 of zeros. It's already public. Oh, is that right? Out of the 64, yeah. Not recently. Not recently. They think they did not have the last few years. Now, the cool thing is that A3 and A5 are not defined. So there was a standard example called COMP128, 
And if you have heard this name before, you should probably know by now that when uh, Goldberg and Wagner in 98 reverse engineered the protocol for just reading the chip, they already broke A3 and A8, which was very common. Today, people use COMP 128.2 or other protocols. And so far, nobody complained too much. And the reason for that is that, well, we don't really care. You will see in a second. <laughs> The other part, and the part that's interesting for us as the users, is our privacy, our precious privacy. When you go into the train or the bus and you start shouting at your mobile phone, you don't want people around you to eavesdrop. <laughs> How do we do that? We encrypt the information going from the mobile phone to the base station and only to the base station. From the base station to the, to the, the rest of the network, it's unencrypted. So if, for example, you are working for a government agency and you want to eavesdrop to some conversation, you don't have to run after the guy. Just sit at the center of the Verizon or any other mobile provider and just listen to the conversation. It's unencrypted there. Yeah. You ignore A5 slash 0, which is even weaker. You don't consider that attempt. I will get there. Don't worry. So the first early attempts were A51 and A52, which were stream ciphers. A51 uh, accepts 64 bits of key. Usually, 10 bits of these are set to 0. And A52 also accepts these 64 bits. And they're not very strong. How not strong? Well, when A52 was first reverse engineered uh, by, it, I think it was Goldberg, Wagner, and Brenico, they already uh, published an attack of. Goldberg, Liseno. Yeah. Liseno, sorry. It started with a B. Yeah. Uh, so they succeeded to break the cipher into two to the 17 operations, which is roughly a few seconds if you don't really know how to program. Uh, and A5Y had several other issues. And besides this, there, are also, there is also a very special stream cipher called A50 to be used where encryption is really bad. And it accepts zero bits of key as input and produces zero bits of, of key as output to be used in France. Uh, <laughs> it used to be the case. No, it used to be mandated. It's, it's a common nice topic. topic. Most phones uh, will not tell you whether you are encrypting now or not. Uh, there was one model that was made by, uh, I think, uh, Siemens, which uh, could be set into a mode where it will display. Now, if you go everywhere in France, it will usually encrypt using A51. If you go to Paris, the indication that it's encrypted disappeared mysteriously. <laughs> Ooh. Paris thinks are not encrypted. Yeah, but it's Paris. I mean. <laughs> Everything is public domain anyway. Um, the thing about these ciphers, besides being weak, we'll see in a second how weak they are, is the fact that the design was kept secret and had to be reverse engineered, even though, you know, as usual in cryptographic circles, there were leakage you know, over the years, and people started to say, hey, I know there are 64 bits of registers running around there, and there are three registers, and slowly people actually worked on these ciphers, even before there were public knowledge. A51 can be used in all modern countries, Western countries. A52 is to be used in countries where the American secret services and the French secret services wanted to eavesdrop. Uh, that means yeah. Russia, third world countries, Middle East, et cetera, et cetera, including, I mean, Israel. including Israel. Israel still uses A52, best cipher around. <laughs> um, in the next generation of GSM, two and a half or three, they're already using Kasumi, which is a block cipher, which is the entire source of this uh, talk. And it is used in two modes of operation. One of them is F8 as for encryption and F9 for authentication. So it's, you take the same block cipher, you throw it into some sort of an authenticated CBC Mac, authenticated CBC Mac and encryption, some sort of structure. Um, I think one of the reasons they designed everything from scratch was to just to prevent issues with IP. So if you de develop everything on your own, you're secure against the problems. You're, hmm? you're supposed to. In any case, A51, first attack on the real cipher was by uh, Bryokov, Shamir, and Wagner, 2000. Then there was some attack by Matt, uh, sorry, uh, MJB. It's Maximov, Johnson, and I'm terribly sorry. If, if your name starts with B, I, I keep on forgetting that. Uh, and then there was uh, the BM and Burkan from 2006. You can break today A51 in about two to the 30-something operations. Or if you get me, give me some data, I can do it even faster. So 
so it's relatively broken. A52, on the other hand, which is much better, uh, well, well, once it was reverse engineered in 99, it was automatically broken, but there is a very nice attack by BM, uh, BM Balkan and Keller from Crypto 2005, where they just pre-compute the table. There, there is some table of 2 to the 17 to pre-compute, and once you pre-compute it, you get the data from one packet of information. You apply, you multiply it by a matrix 2 to the 17 times. You check some parity code. And once you succeed, you find the key in, hmm, I think this is this the key. I mean, just using multiplication by metrics. Uh, you can do it in less than a second. And recently, there was some, somebody who built tables for A51, uh, the crust and all project of uh, rainbow tables for A51. And at the end of it, you, know, you have rainbow tables, which is really cool. You can do it with one packet also of information and some that and that many terabytes of information. And then they said, well, you know, if you need to attack A53, uh, you just ask the mobile phone nicely, can you please switch to A51? So actually, the protocol describing which cipher to use is not authenticated. So if you have a mobile phone working in A53, I can go to your mobile phone and tell it, change to A51, because I know how to break A51. Now, the cool part is that this is actually appearing already in the Crypto 2005 paper when you can ask it, can you please switch from A53 to A52? Because it takes less than a second to break you in A52, and I need rainbow tables for A51. So if you really want to attack A53 ciphers, go to uh, A53 crypto system, just go to it, ask it, can you please switch to A52? Get the key. It's the same key in all of I, I, saw, I saw your question. It's the same key. not. <laughs> It's even worse. That's a great idea. A53 uses Kasumi. Kasumi, as you will see in a second, accepts blocks of 64 bits and keys of 128 bits. There is only one problem. The standards say that at the end of A3 and A8, yeah, and, and, and up to this generation, you get 64 bits of a key. But you need 128 bits, so you just copy the 64 bits, duplicate them, and voila, 128-bit key for free. Anyway, there were some theoretical attacks on Kasumi. Uh, we published them in AsiaCrypt 05. And now, at some point, A53 became A54, which is Kasumi, the same mode of operation, but now supports 64 bit, uh, 128 bit keys. Woo! Uh, when you use it in the 3G, network, 3G networks, the same algorithm, A54, is called user authenticated encryption 1. Everything is the same. And th now there is the UAE2, which is based on Snow 3G, which is a stream cipher, accepts keys of 128 bit, designed by Johansson et al. Actually a good cipher. So far, nobody knows how to break it. And the GSM 3G corporation just announced that they are going to introduce UAE3, which will be based on some ch uh, Chinese cipher called Zook. Happens. Has it been published? Uh, actually, the description was recently published, and in, in the Crypto Ramp session, people, Elena Hanshu asked on behalf of this corporation for people to actually break Zook, so they will not have to implement it. I think this was not the official requirement, but I mean, this is an algorithm pushed by the Chinese government. Yes. Uh, wanted phone call algorithms. Yeah, it's going to be just like SMS4 all over again. Uh, now. I have to give some credit to Anderson from 94 and Golish from 97, who actually broke A51 before they knew what A51 is. They did it by just saying, OK, I have that, and that many registers, that, that many sizes. You guess this, you do that. Sort of a random black magic. So a quick overview of F8 and F9. You know, there is a mode of operation. We have to prove that it's indistinguishable, indifferentiable, very secure, that you don't lose security because you're using crazy modes of operation. Uh, F8 was proven to be secure in a paper from 2001. And in the paper from 2003, it was shown that F9 is also secure Mac. Assuming that the underlying block cipher Kasumi is a secure pseudo-random permutation. Everybody are happy? <laughs> wow. Good. Actually, what uh, Iwata and Kohono showed in 2003 is that these proofs were wrong. But Iwata to the rescue. 
He proved in 2004 that if you assume that the block cipher is secure against related key differential attacks, then f8 and f9 are secure. So as long as the adversary cannot break the crypto system when he is allowed to pick two keys and control the extra difference between them, f8 and f9 are secure. Otherwise, well, you lose in security. Yeah. Is it specifically for XOR differences? Or yes. Any XOR differences. <coughs> this is in the proof. The reason for that is that they actually use the same key in F8 and F9, and they, the standard way to transform one key into two keys is you XOR it once with one constant, one with a different constant. I see Josh uh, trying to complete. This is, uh, there are standard tricks. How do you transform one key into two keys? Uh, that uh, XOR of constants is not what we need in our related game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they knew the end is very attractive. They were anticipating it. OK, a bit about Kasumi. So actually, it's a descendant of uh, Misty. There was a block cipher designed by Mitsuru Matsui named Misty1. 64 bit block, 128 bit key. It's a face cell. I will just show you the diagram. So this is a face cell construction. You take 32 bits, you throw them here. 32 bits go here. Each round, they iterate two round functions. The FL, which is given a key, a linear function. But when you don't know the key, well, it's still a linear function, but you don't know which of the linear functions. And the FO, which is in itself face cell like construction of three rounds, using FI, which is in itself face cell like construction of four rounds. It's sort of a... Um, matryoshka. Matryoshka, yeah. Actually, so, it's a very large number of rounds if you count yeah. the uh, yeah. expanded. When you look at it, it's very secure. If you try to go with any differential going from this side to this side, you're going to get completely cooked. In any case, the interesting thing is that FL and FO switch the order. In the, even, in the old rounds, it's first FL and then FO. Otherwise, it's first FO and then FL. Just to make things even more interesting, and after eight rounds of this thing, you get the output. And it was a great rejoicing in the camp. Question so far? So can you describe it as by still with more rounds or some uh, uh, Not really, because you cannot really do that. There are eight phase still rounds. You can treat each of these as some random permutation, independently random permutation. And you have eight rounds of a phase still. That's it. You spend one of those rounds with like four other rounds or something like that. Yeah, but they are all on the same data path. That's the... So actually, each value here is XORed four times with stuff that comes. It can be completely random. For the sake of argument, assume that this is a perfect random permutation, even random function. It's a permutation, but assume it's a random function. You have all the loopy, loopy rack of super pseudo-random permutation after four rounds. Everything is fine, but there are eight rounds. Actually, we're using this fact a bit. So, so you're saying it would have been much better off if they'd done just two dozen real Feistel rounds instead of this nested Feistel? Depending on what you define as real Feistel rounds. They might have been better. OK. So here is a summary of attacks so far. Just a comment. Uh, yeah. This picture describes both Misty and Kasumi. There are differences uh, no. in the key schedule. This is not in Misty. This S7 does not exist in this. Yes, that's one uh, difference. But also the key schedule is different. The key schedule is different. I'm going to talk about it. And uh, the point is that the original MISTI, as of today, still has 128-bit security. Uh, there are no known attacks on MISTI. If you are looking at Kasumi, it has practical time. What did they do wrong with this transition? There is a slide at the end. This is a great question. I have a slide. Um, the interesting part about the um, key schedule algorithm, they transform the key schedule from MIST1, which was highly nonlinear, to something which is linear. You take the key, you XOR it with a series of constants, and then thus generating 256 bits of key. And each round, you use 128 bits of subkey material, which is linearly derived from the key. And it's always the same, in the sense that this KO in the first round, it comes from the first word of the key. In the second round, it's the second word of the key, third word of the key. There are eight 16-bit words. And each time, you use all of them in each round. 128 bits of subkey each round. Lots of fun. But luckily, everything is linearly dependent. 
So, distinguishing attack on four rounds um, from 2001, you can attack up to six rounds using two keys in a simple related key differential attack. Impossible differentials can do it with one key up to six rounds in 2 to the 55 chosen plaintext and 2 to the 100 time, a work by uh, Kuhn from Eurocrypto 1. Then we had a series of related key boomerang and related key uh, rectangle attacks that could break the entire cipher in 2 to the 54.6 chosen plaintext and 2 to the 76.1 time. So, you know, the standard theoretic uh, cryptanalytic game, game is over, cipher is broken. Who cares? Luckily for us, we can, using new techniques, uh, reduce the data complexity to 2 to the 26 and the time to 2 to the 32. I hope it's impressive. OK, a quick introduction to differential cryptanalysis. Uh, how many of you ever heard about differential cryptanalysis? What? Yeah. I, I know that the people from Three Fish never heard about that. Uh, <laughs> I have the feeling that this talk is going to be rated not PG-13, but non-cryptographic audience only. Um, anyway, so how it's work, it's a work by uh, Biam and Shamir, and Adi is going to be presented on the slides quite a lot. Um, instead of looking actually at the development of the encryption of one value, you look at differences. You look at two values, you look at how the difference, which is usually going to be the XOR, develops through the encryption algorithm. Why this is interesting? Assume for a second you have this simple operation when you take the key and you extra it with some data. Now, if I have two inputs, x and x star, and I throw them in through the same operation, on one hand, I'm going to get uh, x, x or k, and the second value is going to be x star, x or k. But when I look at the extra, of, the extra of these two values, the k disappears and I get x, x, or x star. So if I knew the difference before the, the operation, I will know the difference after the operation, which would allow me to throw away the key and disregard the key. And this is the best thing you can do in cryptanalysis, just throw away the key. Of course, I'm cheating. But the cheat comes from the fact that now you cannot handle nonlinear operations. I mean, you can go through all the linear operations. If you know the difference before a linear operation, you will know the difference after a linear operation. The same goes for fine operations. Nonlinear op non operations, on the other hand, you cannot do. What you do, you actually approximate these nonlinear operations using probabilities. If I add this input difference, I will have this output difference with that and that probability. OK, so instead of discussing values or differences, you can discuss the probability distribution of these differences. So three comments about differential cryptanalysis, the concepts that we will need in mind. First of all is differential characteristic. This is a prediction on all the differences each and every round. If you start with this difference, after one round you will have this difference with this probability. After two rounds it's going to be this difference with this probability, and so forth. A differential, you know, it doesn't really matter how I get from here to my hotel, as long as I get there. So it's input difference, output difference, and the probability to get from point A, to point A to point B. That's it. So far, so good. And of course, the probability of a differential characteristic is the multiplication of all the probabilities of the differentials along the way. Assuming we oh. Great comment. I have a slide. <laughs> <laughs> and. The probability of the differential is the sum of all the probabilities of the differential characteristics that share input and output. And there is the concept of right pair, which is a pair that satisfies either the differential or the differential characteristic, depending on what I'm trying to do. Now, generally speaking, if you, want to, if you have a differential or differential characteristic with probability p, you need about 1 over p pairs, which satisfy the input difference. Sorry. Question so far? This is just geometric distribution. If the probability of succeeding is 1%, one, is 1%, you have to try about 100 times until you succeed. OK. So how does the differential attack work? You take many, many pairs. One of them, at least one of them, has to be a right pair. You try to identify the right pair. And then you analyze it. And why do you gain information from right pairs? 
the pair that satisfy the differential characteristic or the differential gives you information about what happened inside the nonlinear operations. So it gives you more information about what's going on inside, and usually you can use this information to find the key. Now, the exact analysis depends whether you're using differential or differential characteristic. It depends if you're attacking the number of rounds of the differential or more rounds. You can do what is called NR attacks, where you try to attack more rounds than there are in the differential. And there is also distinguishing attacks where you can tell this block cipher is indeed eight rounds of AES, or this block cipher is not eight rounds of AES. So this is what you do. And that's it. Questions on differential cryptanalysis? There will be exam at the end. So. OK, let's move to boomerang attacks. Now that we have differentials, and we know that differentials are really, really bad for you, unless you're attacking, you design the block cipher such that it will be secure against differential cryptanalysis. How do you do that? You make sure that there is no differential with probability more than, let's say, 2 to the minus 110 in your cipher. Because then that means that you need 2 to the 110 pairs that satisfy the input difference in order to find one right pair. And so this is the way to build secure ciphers. And at some point, people started to have very long ciphers with very nice proof of, proofs of security. And what Wagner had to do in 99 was to actually try to break such ciphers. So assume for, assume for a second that you have a very long cipher, no good differential for the entire cipher. However, if you cut the cipher in half, you have a good differential for the first part, good differential for the second part, but they don't combine. So the boomerang attack is a way to actually combine it. And the idea is as follows. Assume that you have a differential alpha goes to beta in the first cipher, in the first half, and gamma goes to del delta in the second. And for the sake of argument, assume everything happens with probability 1. It makes life easier. So we start with two plain text P1 and P2. With beta is than gamma. Otherwise, you could combine. Yeah, beta is different than gamma. If beta is equal to gamma, everybody are happy, besides the designer of the cipher. So if you start with alpha difference and you partially encrypt, you will get beta difference. Again, everything probability 1. That would be great to stop here, but encryption continues. So x1 becomes c1, x2 becomes c2. Great. Now, let's do the boomerang magic. If you take c2 and extra delta to it, you're going to get c4. Now, when you decrypt c4 and you get x4, you're going to get a gamma difference here because gamma went to delta with probability 1. And using regular differentials, everything is symmetric. Not, it doesn't matter if you go downwards or upwards, backwards or forward. And you will get gamma difference here. And if I will do the same thing with C1, I will get here C3, which will be decrypted to X3. Again, gamma difference. Now, the interesting part is that X3 and X4 satisfy a very interesting relation, which is difference gamma, beta, gamma. The gamma cancels out, and the difference here is beta. Now, if I have values with difference beta here, they will go back to two plain text here with difference alpha. If there are probabilities involved, if the probability of this step is p and this step is q, then the total probability is p squared, because you have to satisfy both differentials, and q squared times q squared, because you have to satisfy two differentials at the bottom. OK, this is the boomerang attack. Um, and you can do it with related key differentials as well, and not entering into too much details about what the related key differentials are. You're just allowed to tweak with the differences in the key. Remember the proof of security if the difference x or exactly this thing. You can do the same with uh, related key differentials. It's a bit tricky with the relations between the keys. But if you select everything correctly, everything is fine. OK. Is that the same? The BDK05 is the same one? The imagery? No, it's actually BDK05. It's Eurocrypt05. There was a paper by Hong et al. from this is FSC05, which was submitted in parallel. And this is Kim et al. from ACISP04, if I'm not mistaken, who actually submitted it to a conference that nobody heard of. <laughs> so this is two keys and four keys and four keys and 256 keys. OK. Yeah. OK. So a small technical detail about differential hypnosis is the fact that we assume that stuff works which is usually the case, especially when you have an attack of 2 to the 100 complexity, you assume it works. And the reason for that is that we don't really know to, to deal with things otherwise. 
So assume for a second that we define a set of all the good values for some differential. So if we have a differential alpha goes to beta, I'm just going to, to capture all the good values. And I'm going to pick one of the two in the pair. It doesn't really matter. Um, if you want to formally define it, I mean both p and px or alpha are in this set, meaning if p is in g, gk of alpha goes to beta, that means if you encrypt p under k and px or alpha under k, you will get beta difference in the output. And now you can almost immediately see how can I use differential cryptanalysis in attacks by identifying in which of the sets gk I am, I can tell you something about the key. Because it's not the same plaintext which is in all the sets. Most of the time it's going to be this plaintext in this set and this plaintext in this set. So by identifying which of the values is the right pair, you will identify in which set you are. And you can define the inverse uh, the set for the ciphertext. OK. Now, there is an underlying, underlying assumption about the probabilities when you define the probabilities of uh, differential characteristic. And this is what Adi mentioned before. If you're trying to predict the probability of a differential for many rounds, we usually assume it's the multiplication of all the probabilities for each and every step on the way, each and every round. And you have to assume that these actually are independent of each other, that the event Assume for a second that you have a differential alpha goes to beta goes to gamma. And you ask yourself, what the probability that alpha goes to gamma? You have to assume that the set of the good ones with respect to alpha goes to beta is independent of the set beta goes to gamma. And then the probability is just a multiplication. Now, another independence assumption which is used in attacks. There are cases in which you don't need this independence assumption. This is when you are XORing a new independent subkey after uh, End of the, uh, Amazingly good comment. <laughs> um, this is something related to actually key recovery is that most of the time, and this is something for people who don't do cryptanalysis, we find a distinguisher for seven rounds of Kasumi and we want to attack eight rounds. The standard way to do it, you partially try all the subkeys of the eighth round, you partially decrypt. If the decryption was correct, you're going to get seven rounds of the cipher, which is distinguished well, from random. If you use the wrong key, then it's as if you added another layer of encryption, another round. And then you expect it to be closer to random because it's more probable that most of the time. It's more probable that seven rounds are closer to seven rounds than nine rounds are closer to seven rounds. <laughs> Most of the time. There are very special cases when you can screw up this independent assumption, but I think it's a legitimate one. OK. So actually, we can look at Cypher where all the subkeys are independent of each other. If all the subkeys are independent from each other, then indeed the probability of one value being in the right set for the first step is independent of it being in the second step, or et cetera. Now, for such a Cypher, so oh, even if you're adding, and as long as you're covering, as long as you're mixing the key correctly and you don't screw up too much, I mean, don't multiply by the key. But as long as you're adding or XORing and you can transform any value to any value, you're fine. If the probability of transformation of any value to any value by the subkey operation is uniform, life is great. Life is good, actually. Great would be when we will break the system. Now, sorry. Sorry, the? I didn't get the macro chain part. Why is it just independent? Because, because then this, each step, each transition is independent of previous steps. Because what happened previously is independent. If each time I XOR, I add in, I transform the value to a randomly chosen value. But it's not completely independent of all the together. If all the subkeys are independent, then each step is independent of all others. That's true. If yeah, I think there are exceptions for FISO ciphers if the key is only in part of the function or something like that. But it's certainly true if you have an SP network where you XOR in the whole key. Yeah, you have to XOR everything. Even in SP networks, if all the subkeys are independent, you can still get it from a different point of view. Let's say even in DES, this assumption works. So there are ways to build counterexamples. I would be, I will admit, but if you know the ways, you probably know what I'm going to say next. So. Please, on behalf of the people who get completely confused by that, including myself. OK. Now, the problem is that 
how, how the analysis works. I pick a plaintext at random, I pick the key at random, and then the probability that this plaintext or this plaintext pair will satisfy the differential is indeed the multiplication of each and every step on the way. But usually, the adversary goes to the device, please be kind enough to encrypt me this plaintext, this plaintext, this plaintext. The key is fixed once. So actually, we're cheating. Because the key is not fixed after fixing the message. And for each message, it's chosen independently. We fix the key once. And therefore, we need to assume some sort of a, a stochastic uh, equivalence, which means that it doesn't really matter what's the order of operations. Either you first pick the key and then pick the plaintext, or first pick the plaintext and then fix the key, it should be OK. Most of the time, it is. However, there are ciphers where, where this is not the case. Usually, this gives rise to issues with weak keys, keys for which the behavior is completely different than the usual. IDEA is a notorious example of cipher with lots of related key issues. On the other hand, you can construct something that is called conditional differentials. This differential works if key bit is equal to 0. So there are lots of issues running around there. Most of the time, most of the ciphers, this is the case. You can assume it without making too many mistakes on the way. For the boomerang attack, the situation is much more complicated because we actually have two differentials and four pairs. And it might be the case that this pair is independent of this pair, but they are dependent with these pairs. Because there are four values here. Each is used in two different pairs with respect to two different differentials. So the entire independence assumptions that you need to assume are much stronger. So roughly speaking, you need to assume that the fact that this value is part of a right pair does not prevent this value from being a right pair with respect to this differential, this differential, the second differentials. And this does not affect the third pair. Yeah. Okay here, right? It's just you don't want negative dependence between these events. Yes. Okay. The independence assures us it's p squared q squared. Right. But you if happier would be lower. Exactly. I would be very happy if it would have been higher. I would actually be very happy if it was zero as well. If you could prove that it doesn't work, there is a variant of the boomerang attack called the related, uh, sorry, the impossible boomerang by Jiki and Glue, which uses the fact that something happens with probability 0. Uh, so this is the formal definitions of what we need. Not very interesting. And here is a counter example. Let's assume for a second that the first differential has alpha goes to beta, one specific value of beta, with very high probability, let's say half. And the most significant bit has a difference 0 in it. And not only that, it has to be the actual bit has to be 0. If the actual bit of the value is 0, then the pair is part of, the, of a right pair. Now, if what comes up from the bottom part is a differential with the most significant bit equal to 1, it won't work because one pair succeeds, the other one cannot succeed. So you can give it formal definitions that say, you know, um, the thing is that boomerang attack can use many differentials in the forward direction, in the first cipher, in the second cipher. So you, you have to construct the example carefully. But you can show and construct very nice examples. And there are also more delicate examples if you follow with differential hypnosis, where you make sure that something happens through the difference, something goes through the same S book twice with four different values that cannot all coexist in a coherent manner. And if you want the full details of this example, there is a very nice paper by Sean Murphy where he shows on DES, a real cipher, he didn't, you know, I, cook, I can cook examples, but he took DES and he showed there a four round boomerang that doesn't go back, that doesn't come back. And the name of the boomerang is because you take something, you throw it, it rotates and comes back to you. And if it doesn't come back to you, hmm? well, now, to some extent, if you use multiple differentials, the problem tends to shrink. Because if it doesn't work with this set of differentials, it will work with this set of differentials. And the thing is that usually there is sort of a karma thingy going around. If there is, in theory, all the sets 
if there, are de if there is dep a positive dependency in some place, you're going to get negative dependency in the other place and vice versa. Because the sum of all probabilities is 1. So if you lose something here, you must gain something there. So you know, in the grand scheme of life, everything should be OK. Um, if, if that's not systematically key dependent. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, you have to, I wouldn't say pray, <laughs> but you have to accept the fact that you know, the gods might, might be playing tricks with you. Or the NSA, depending which cipher you're attacking. Uh, sorry, that, uh, I'm just curious. I saw the picture. Is it possible to write a relationship for this boomerang attack? Like, like, maybe just on the board. What are you hoping? You're hoping that p of x uh, plus, you know, gamma inverse. I mean, what is the relationship? I mean, this p squared q squared that, relationship is it, like it's it's, a simple formula. Of this is the probability. If everything is independent. This is the probability if you have one differential with probability p and one with probability q. And the p squared q squared comes from the fact that you use the same differential. You use each differential twice. So I'm just curious, what is the relationship that you get? So you, you take a, I mean, what is the final attack? Sorry, I mean, I saw it from the picture. I'm just okay. curious, sorry. It's That's a good question. So if you start with two plaintexts with alpha difference and you process this, uh, this process, you're going to get here two, uh, two plaintexts with the same alpha difference. So you start with two plaintexts, you get the same. You get two ciphertexts. The difference is here, but it doesn't matter. You just uh, add the same thing in there. I see. So you relate. Uh, I see two differences with plaintiffs. I see. I was just going to say is that initially it seemed to me that the attack was just another way to prove a standard differential attack. But you're saying there is no standard differential no, relationship. No, because it, beta is is different than gamma. Then you cannot connect them together. If you could have connected connected them together, it would be fun. It's not always that fun. Anyway, as I said, it is sort of karma. If you lose some place, you win some other place. And here is an example of the bright side of dependence. Assume for a second that you have alpha goes to beta, and the last round of the differential characteristic is delta x going to delta y. And when you have on the backward direction delta being decrypted to gamma, you assume you have a zero difference here on the right-hand side. And this is an example. So let's assume for a second that we have a pair of values, xA and xB, which are being encrypted. There is delta x here, delta y here. They satisfy the first differential characteristic. We are very happy, thrilled to say that at least. And the encryption continues. And then we generate two new values, xC and xD, coming from the bottom up using the delta differences going up. OK, there is a gamma difference between xA and xC, and between xB and xD, but this is in a second. Which means that if you will put xc here, you're going to get yc. And the interesting part is that the difference between xc and xa in the right-hand side is 0, meaning that actually this is xa. We will do the animation again. It works. xa, so you're going to get ya. The same goes with xd and xb. xd becomes yd, but actually this is xb, which goes to yb, which means that if you look at what you have here is xa, xb going to ya, yb. Delta x, delta y. So no matter what's the probability of this transition going down, you're going to get it for sure at this side, even when you're dealing with xc and xd. OK? Always look at the bright side of dependence. So this allows us actually to break the cipher into something which is a bit more complicated on one hand. On the other hand, it allows us to do a better analysis of what's going to happen. So we have a differential alpha goes to beta here for the first cipher. We have gamma goes to delta in the second cipher. And there is some sort of a transition in the middle where you get two values here with beta difference. You get two values here with gamma difference. And you ask yourself, what's the probability of getting beta difference here? The interesting thing is that if delta x went here to delta y, it doesn't matter which delta y it was. Even if this delta y was not the delta y of the differential characteristic, some other delta y, we don't care because it's going to be canceled here as well. And you're going to get the same difference here as you would get here. So the last round of the differential characteristic in the first round does not cost you anything. You get things for free. Promotion. 
So then you can do the analysis of what's the probability of this entire structure to succeed. Well, it's the probability of this differential times the probability of this differential, this differential, this differential, and the probability that the magic in the middle would, would work. Of course, you have to take into consideration that there are dependencies between these conditions. Now, the thing is that there are several earlier works, mostly by Dimitri, uh, who actually did similar things for SP networks and, S, uh, and also in facels. But one of the problems there was you, I just shown you that there is dependence issue. And then you assume that there is a dependence issue. You exploit it as much as you can. And then you say, starting at this point, everything is independent, which is kind of tricky. You have to do it very carefully. Probably most of the time it works. Uh, so in phase cells, you can use either uh, gamma r equals to 0, meaning that the right-hand side here would be 0. Or if it happens to be that gamma r is equal, equal to beta r, it's just swapping the order, order of the values. It also works well. Just repeat the previous example with flipping uh, xc becomes xb and xd becomes xa. OK? You didn't mention, by the way, why we call it the sandwich. Oh, the sandwich. Yeah, why we call it the sandwich? Thick slice of bread, <laughs> thick slice of bread, and here put anything in the middle which your religious authority allows you. Ham and cheese, uh, I don't know, whatever you want to put there. Spam. Hmm? Well, you have hardly any religious authorities allow spam. Okay. Or uh, health authorities either, really. Well, at least this is not the same, same morphism attack. Sorry, this is Washington. You're allowed to. It's allowed here, right? It's not like in California that same morphism attacks are in, are not allowed. Homomorphism attacks are not. Uh, sorry. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Good. Anyway, uh, the thing is that Kasumi, which is uh, you know the main point of this talk, has a very nice three-round related key differential. So nice it has probability one over four. And you can actually force it to be half if you twiddle two plain text bits. So you just flip one bit here. You flip one bit of the key. And with probability 1 over 4, you're going to get this. And we experimentally verified that this is indeed the case. Now, the good thing is that you can actually push everything four rounds forward. You cannot push it three rounds forward because of the fact that the order of the FL and the FO changes. So you cannot use the same thing, but you can push it four rounds. And then you find yourself with the following situation. Um, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0 goes to the same thing. Going back, and as you can see in the middle, we have a problem because we have three rounds here, three rounds here. And there is this annoying fourth round. Luckily for us, this is the same difference. So there was a great rejoicing in the camp because now everything is flipped. OK, some small technicalities. Probability first differential 1 over 4, second differential 1 over 4. There is a probability in the transition. The reason there is a, a probability in the transition, we're using related key differentials. So various differences in the keys pop up in different various locations. So we don't get it for free. We get its probability to the minus 6. So the total probability is to the minus 14 for seven rounds of Kasumi. Just to give you an indication, the previous sort of probability impurity in 7 round Kasumi was 2 to the minus uh, 45. So this is actually minus quite. Is yeah. in, in real crypto system that was designed after the introduction of differential cryptanalysis, a, a real cipher. Or field. One of the most important ciphers in the history of cryptography. So why this is 2 to the minus 6, if you want the exact details. So we have color coding. I would like to express my apologies in front of, in, on behalf of any one of you who is, happens to be colorblind. I'm terribly sorry. Uh, you will have to do with me telling you the names of the colors. Uh, you have four values, xa, xb, xc, xd. If they all have the same color, that means they have the same value. 
random value. We don't care as long as it's the same. And of course, here you have xa equals to xd and xb equals to xc, but they are not equal between themselves. And you can get the first round for free, the second round for free. And then in the third round, you have xa equals to xd, xb equals to xc, which is this case. And it happens to be the case that here xa equals to xd, xb equals to xc. And everything works fine until the point where you extra the keys. And you extra two different keys with two different values. So we transform everything. And we might get screwed here, but with probability 2 to the minus 6, either we get the same value in xa, xb, and the same value in xc and xd, or xa equals to xc, or xb equals to xd. And this is actually the fact that it's 2 to the minus 6. Our prediction was 2 to the minus 7. And then I was coding it and counting how many things happen, and suddenly I get twice as, a, as, a, as much as I expect. OK, probably there is some, something wrong in the analysis. We redo, redo the analysis, 2 to the minus 7. Everything is fine. So there's probably a bug in my code, more probable. We go over the code. Nathan actually looked at the code. Um, we have no idea what's going on wrong. I mean, we try to chop rounds. We try to move things around. It's still twice as much as we expect, you know, until the moment that you have this eureka moment where you never run around naked in the streets of Tel Aviv. OK, uh, any case, we just found out it's 2 to the minus 6 because there are two options. Uh, implement, implement, implement. Anyway. No, no, this blue square is not necessarily this blue square. Oh. It's always inside the, we don't what care. About, what about the blank ones? You don't uh, th th these ones are just balanced, meaning that if you take the XOR of all these four, you're going to get zero, which is the property that we need. At the end, you need to have balance in both sides. And this happens with probability to the minus six. Um, in any case. So you take 2 to the 24 ciphertext. We do it from the bottom-up approach. Uh, you can do it if you really insist the other way around. You partially decrypt. The, you ask the decryption, sorry, the full decryption. Sorry. You XOR with alpha. You ask for the encryption. You collect the new ciphertext. There is a way to throw away most of the wrong quartets immediately. There is a new trick that we take a bit more extra data in order to identify the right quartets immediately, and you can almost immediately identify the right quartets. And you find all the right quartets immediately. And then um, you just analyze the last round, the eighth round. In theory, you would try all possible 128-bit subkeys, partially decrypt, and see what works. The thing is that there are 128-bit subkeys, so it would take 2 to the 128. So we do slightly different analysis, reordering everything. And you can, do, you can find 96 bits of the key in 2 to the 32 operations. And the reminder, 32 bits, you just do exhaustive search on 32 bits, should be doable. Uh, questions? So actually, our complexity is 2 to the 33. Actually, it's 2 to the 32 because this is 2 to the 32 operations in one round. You don't have to do full encryptions. So it's 1.125 uh, 1 times 2 to the 32. Please allow me to call this 2 to the 32. And if you have issues with this one, 0.125 factor, I'm terribly sorry. I will buy you a beer afterwards. Um, OK, so now we have a very high probability thing. And let's do some experiments. Take 2 to the 16 random quartets. We use the variant with slightly higher probability to avoid several technical issues. So probability is 2 to the minus 13. We would expect eight right quartets. In each of these experiments, we repeat it 10,000 10, times. And you can see that, in theory, we would expect 34 of these experiments to have no right quartets. And in 32, we got, which is good. Uh, I think I, I really like the, se the 7 and the 8 examples, because this looks like we cooked the numbers. <laughs> the code is running. I cannot send you the code, because it's in France. And exporting cryptographic code from France is a complete mess. Is that true for the hmm? the truth, This is not cryptographic code. Well, uh, we, used, we used the, f the official Kasumi implementation. Oh. Mm. So even though you can download it from here, from a server that sits that resides in Finland, I'm not going to send the code outside. I'm terribly sorry. Please feel free to hack into the computers at ENS. It's hidden somewhere there. Uh, once you do, there, there are several bugs in the system that you need to fix, but we'll discuss it later. I really ran the experiment. And it, 
Hmm? Get all the numbers in the experiments and get 10,000. Surprisingly oh. enough, this is the case. I hope. Uh, and you can, it seems very close by. And you will have to trust me, I really ran the experiment. Um, OK, let's try the eight round attack. And what we're going to do, I know the key, I selected the key. So I'm going to decrypt the last round and check if the attack works. I mean, just to see that everything works when I add the eighth round and check all the dependencies issues and that sort of stuff. So you take 2 to the 24 starting ciphertexts, and so in total 2 to the 26 data. Probability 2 to the minus 14, we cannot enjoy the factor 2 that we had before. And the probability is 2 to the minus 14. I repeat the experiment. I would expect about four right quartets. And, and you can see that it's still close enough. These are not cooked, unlike the previous results, but it also looks very good. The previous were not cooked as well. The 8 is very suspicious. OK. It would be suspicious if you had no curve. Um, yeah, next time when I'm cook I cook numbers, so <laughs> take it into consideration. OK. Now, seriously, though, we have an attack. Everything works. Let's take one of these instances, which, which we had seven right quartets, and run analysis. Great. So I took them. I timed exhaustive key search on my machine. It took 26 minutes. I used the official code of Kasumi. You know, afterwards, you will hear comments like, but you re-implemented Kasumi. How you know it's the real Kasumi? I don't know. I write very bad code, so it took the official code. It takes 26 minutes. OK, so let's see how much time my code runs. 430 minutes. OK, that's a, that's a good first generation code. Let's improve it a bit. Let's improve it even a bit more. A bit extra. Hire me. I'm really good. <laughs> 2 to the 12, uh, sorry, 212 minutes. And at that point, I said, OK, OK, OK. I did all the tricks that I know. I used the memory in different ways. I did, I did everything by the book. Something went wrong, and we looked inside. Actually, we found out that we, ex we invoked the exhaustive, uh, exhaustive search part eight times. That means that I couldn't reach way, much below 200 anyway. Uh, in all other attacks, at that point, I said, OK, we know that exhaustive key search takes. 26 minutes. I'm just going to count how many times I call exhaustive search, and I, I just add the running time. There is no point actually running it. Uh, in all other attacks, we hit a minimum of two. At least you have to call the exhaustive key search at least twice. Now, there is a reason the title of the slide is all I really need to know I learned in. Apparently, when you deal with differential attacks, there is a small technicality. You cannot distinguish between the key and the key x for the difference. It's technicality. Come and ask me afterwards why this is the case. But you cannot do that. So of course, you're always going to get two keys. But why, why did you get four, eight? This, well, happens. You know, bad luck. I happen to pick the case with seven right quartets that succeed in finding only 93 bits of the key. Bad luck. So this time we run the attack 100 times. Again, throwing, throwing away the exhaustive key search part is not interesting. In 78 of these experiments, we could actually find the key. The theory predicted 76%, so we're fine. In 46 of these, it would have taken up to four exhaustive key searches. So it's about 120 minutes, 110 minutes, which is quite practical. And in 12 more, you need eight exhaustive searches. The worst case, I think, was about 200 exhaustive searches in one out of, I think that at this point you can say, well, sorry, we fail. It just changes the success rate a bit. No, nothing too important there. OK, so this is actually a practical attack. I hope that we all agree. The thing is, this is not a practical attack. This is a practical complexity attack. You cannot attack A53 in real Cipher, in, in real deployment. There are two reasons for that. The first reason is the fact that we need four related keys in the attack. I was hiding this fact, but we use four related keys. Due to the fact that you take the key and you, and you just duplicate it, you can get two out of these four keys. But the four keys cannot all of them together be allowed. They, they are not allowed in 
the GSM networks in A53. In A54 and UAE1, you can get the four keys, but you cannot attack GSM networks. Another reason we cannot really attack is that we need adaptive chosen plaintext and ciphertext capabilities. F8 and F9, due to many reasons, do not give you adaptive chosen plaintext and ciphertext capabilities. So this is only attack on the crypto system, which shows that the crypto system is not that great, but don't worry. There are more serious issues with your mobile phones that, than Kasumi. Okay. So, some final thoughts. Um, the, the actual implementation found a factor of two difference between theory and practice. And you know that in practice, practice wins, but in theory, the theory wins. Um, so please, whenever you have an attack which is close to implementation, please implement, verify, implement, verify, implement, repeat. Actually, it gave us also a factor two in the analysis, the implementation. So as I said, karma thing. Everything balances out at the end. Um, now it's more worth to mention that there are seven, seven possible sandwiches. You can shift everything a bit, and then you can get the different subway. Just put here some random sandwich joke. I don't have to. <laughs> In any case, it takes a bit 75% extra data, and then you find the full 96-bit key. You solve the issue of two keys, and Everything is fine. Just def decide if it's worth the effort. Um, now, an interesting variant, and one of the changes that the, the designers of Kasumi did were to was to change the key schedule. Now, assume for a second they changed the key schedule slightly differently. Sli slightly differently. Instead of using this word here and this word here, they would flip them in all locations, which would be consistent with their design criteria. Everything would be fine. So if you do the same, if you do this, the probability of the transition drops to zero. Uh, and we actually verified it experimentally. Now, that's kind of stupid to experimentally verify something that never happens, but we actually repeated the experiment, and all experiments failed. OK. If you really want the reason, I can show it to you. It's here in the color diagram. If you don't really want the reason, it's something with the S-boxes. The S-boxes have a very flat difference distribution table, meaning that there are no four inputs with the same input difference, the same output difference. And this is required. In the previous attacks, we use this fact. We use this fact for our advantage. And here, we cannot use this fact to our advantage, because at some point, you're going to get four different values entering into the S-boxes, and you're not going to get the XR of all of them will not be zero at the end. Game over. OK, so if you really want the, the technical details, why is it? I mean, it's just a matter of the actual differences that go in. So were they smart moving from Misty to Kasumi? First of all, the changes that they did was actually moving the FL, the linear functions, from the data path to the round function. In Misty, the FL functions are on the data path. Uh, it sometimes offers more protection. It sometimes offers le less protection. So you can build variants that make it stronger or weaker. They removed one key addition. And actually, this adds to the security. I think this is one of the worst conclusions that you can think of in cryptanalytic attack. Remove the XOR with the key. It will make your cipher more secure in some key schedules. I mean, you could fix the previous problem if the, the last extra would have been there. The black art of cryptanalysis. Uh, they added rotations to the linear function. The actual linear, the FL in, in Misty does not have rotations to the left. It doesn't affect us, but it might help or might prevent other attacks. They have one more layer of S-boxes in FI. Without this, our attack would be two to the six times faster. On the other hand, the previous failing argument would not exist. So depending what you're trying to achieve, they use different locations for the, sub for the sub keys. You know, you can rotate the place, put things. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. They changed the S-boxes. Now, we didn't really use properties of the S-box besides in the counter example where you need something to not happen. But it wouldn't have worked in the previous S-box as well. And they changed the key schedule. 
which made everything linear, which helped us a lot. But, you know, I can reconstruct a key schedule which is more secure or less secure. So all in all, this is something which is OK. Dirty details, 2 to 26 adaptive chosen plaintext and ciphertext. As I said, you cannot achieve them in practice in a field machine, but it's actually an interesting, uh, it's a small amount. 2 to 30 bytes of memory. One gigabyte of memory. That's it. You just need to store all the new ciphertext, and you immediately throw all the interesting parts. Time complexity to. Great observation that you can use the memory in your cellular phone. In order to oh yeah, <laughs> you can use. I mean, you put a virus on the machine, and instead of getting the key directly from the SIM card, which you can do by the way, the phone can access the SIM card and ask the keys directly. I, I told you that cryptanalytic attacks are not the most worrying thing <laughs> in phone, but. In theory, let's assume that they do not allow you that, but they allow the phone to ask for encryption of stuff. You can actually do that. Uh, time complexity, 2 to the 32, 2 to the 33. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to haggle with you about a factor of 2. OK? Just start a cloud computer and, I mean, start two of these. And actually, it's fully implemented. Thank you. What about the Sorry? Okay. There are the what is it? Uh, what was your question before? I asked, what did they do wrong in the transition? Oh. As far as your implementation goes, I mean, is that really the, the real reason you don't want to share it? Is simply because the use consuming? And, uh, could, and as a follow up, couldn't you just remove that and say, add Kasumi call here, and then go ahead and distribute it? <coughs> there is always a problem when you try to distribute script analytic code. You never know who is going to try and use it for really bad things. Now, my assumption is that the really, really bad people probably can probably read the paper and implement on their own. But I see no reason to help them. I mean, and besides, it would expose the way I write code, which would be very embarrassing. I mean, I would immediately get a job offer from three software companies. But, um, but usually, cryptanalytic code is delicate. Can it's something. This was a period. This appeared in this script. In the in the Chrome session or the the real the real oh. the real script. Being it, you'll find the paper. Yeah, uh, the paper is also the full paper with all the dirty details about the impossible variant. is is on ePrint. Um, okay, great. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, if anyone wants a copy or snippets of the code, like the include stdio. I'm willing to supply this. <laughs> yeah. I used to think that uh, related key are science fiction. Then, of course, came WAP, and I woke up in a hurry. But would they all be stopped in practice by running every key through encryption with a, with a, with a key of zero, or am I too naive? If you're using an algorithm like T, then it won't help. Because T has issues, related key issues, which are so large, or like DS. You know, there are complementation properties issues. So you might actually fall in one of these. So you have to be very careful. Or in idea, for example, the key zero is in so many wiki classes. So the, the key zero is not the perfect selection. Pick, pick something else. But uh, I, th I think that I've heard the suggestion, just take the key, throw it through MD5. Yeah. MD5 is not great hash function. Uh, we all agree, but it should be sufficiently good against this sort of thing. Yeah, it should work. but. For, for a simpler, for a cheaper cost, you can have better key schedules. Instead of starting MD5 and initialization, finalization, and you know, relying on some other primitive. For exactly the same, this reason, uh, you know, if we had uh, an attack uh, in 232 time, single key attack on a crypto system, we will put the title a practical attack on this crypto system. And here, we were very careful to say a practical time attack on uh, this script system, uh, because it's fair. Uh, I wouldn't call this attack practical mm -hmm. due to the difficulty of mounting related key attacks in most practical scenarios. So could you say a little bit more about F9? So you said that the proof goes through, but it requires this particular related key uh, resilience, and which it looks like this doesn't have. Is that right? Or... OK, so the proof assumes that the adversary has access to two keys. So the fact that you are using four doesn't nullify the proof I see. yet. 
I mean, I guess that asking uh, Tetsu Iwata about it, when we had the first attack from 2005, he, he looked at it and he said, listen, it's four keys, so everything is fine. Um, again, it's sort of, you know, th there is this concept of confidence and trust, and you, you, you need this warm, fuzzy feeling inside you when you look at a crypto system. And the fact that, you know, you add two more keys to the adversary and everything collapses is, it's kind of weak. I mean, at some point, someone would say, okay, take the four-round differential characteristic that you had, add a two-round differential with no related keys. I mean, if you really want to try and improve this attack, probably there are several ways to improve it, to make it work against uh, Kasumi with two related keys. It's not going to be an amazing attack, but it's going to be to break the security proof. But uh, I think there is a saying that says that everything which is uh, provably secure is probably not. Yes. And in any case, Kasumi is not a problem. I mean, even if you throw away Kasumi, you put AES. You know what? Don't put AES. Put some, whatever you want to put. The problem is in the interface because you can ask the SIM card, can you please give me this secret information? I, I didn't mention it. Each SIM card has about 10 pre-shared secrets with your operator of 128 bits, the best case you can think of. And your mobile phone is allowed to ask it from the SIM card. Are you, are you sure about that? This is what implementation people told me. Even, not, it's, sure even though it's very... Specs ...and tried to remove those keys. And I, had, I mean, I'm no expert, but I have tried to do it. And it does seem like they specifically try not to let you do that. From what I understood, you can just take the SIM card, put it in your own, and just ask the SIM card. Maybe the phone doesn't ask it. A. B. There are so many specs. I said it at the beginning of the talk. 2, 2.5, 2 2.9, 0.95. God knows what's running around there. And most attacks, at the end, if you have access to the mobile phone, it's very simple to read the data from the SIM card anyway. There are people who actually do that. Uh, well, that's the original comment the 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 attack the was on a daily basis. I thought the, the original point of the like the original Comp 128 attack was really to remove you query the SIM card so many times that you derive that pre shared key. Yeah. And and I don't and I think once they fix that, there's no at least known to my knowledge way to actually get that pre shared key out of it. Otherwise, you could clone SIM cards fairly easy. I and that's know what they want to do. One person who actually does it almost on a daily basis. But he does it by kind of invasive uh, attack. Yeah. Now that, yes. I, now that I believe. Etc. But yeah. I think that the API, how you are allowed to access the SIM card, right, does not allow you to uh, ask, please give me the key. Okay. So if you can go ahead and like shave off some top and you know take mm. really good photographs of it, then, then yes, OK, it then do it I shaving. It does it in a way that afterwards you give you back the SIM card and you don't know that it was probed. So it might be breaking the protocols through some other whole yeah. loophole or some. Cool. But but there is a way to do it. I, I know of a guy doing that. Yeah, and but he actually takes it out of the phone. When he takes it from the SIM card, he has access to the phone. Oh, sure, sure. This is a physical. In thing. case, by the way, just a comment. Uh, if you ever get arrested in France and you give them your mobile phone and it returns without battery, in the sense that the battery is dead, that means that Someone there read your SIM card. Why do they have to do Can't they recharge the battery at least? I have no idea why they don't do that, but. They're French, so. <laughs> Jacques Clouseau does not charge other people's phones. Right, okay. right. But, but uh, it's a green thing. That's a good excuse. <laughs> you should be in PR. Yeah, you should, right? That would work well. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, well, I have like, two questions. So let me start with uh, kind of a theory question. So what is the percent among all kind of practical or non-practical attack on stream ciphers or block ciphers, you name it? Uh, which fraction of the attacks would survive if you uh, double the number of rounds? In other words, lose a factor of two inefficiency. Um, the, there is a class of attacks. There is a class of attacks called the slide attacks, which is independent of number of rounds. Now, some statistical attacks are so strong in some ciphers that doubling the number of rounds won't help you. 
T has related key issues independent of the number of rounds. Ghost has related key issues independent of the number of rounds. Um, trying to, you know, DES has complementation property even if you double the number of rounds. Even triple DES has complementation property for that matter. Um, so, well, what I'm wondering but is why, why there is always, I mean, I understand in practice people want, you know, if they want the block size or whatever hash function to survive, they want to trim the margins kind of as close as possible to the best attack. But it just I can't help when I see some of those things. There is this remarkable stuff that you guys do. And then very often people say, you know, I said, okay, I can do like seven, but not eight round, but nine is completely hopeless. I was like, why on earth wouldn't those guys just say, okay, like, you know, Standard practice doubles the number of rounds and you know just mandate it so that it's never broken. You know? That was tried in the AES competition uh, where Serpent had 32 rounds right. and Lost. they were running at half the, less than half the speed of the other ones and they didn't win. I know, I mean, this is exactly, Eddie Beacom told me exactly. I'm just curious, you know, for future standards, why don't we just mandate the, the minimal number of uh, you know, rounds or whatever has to be at least a factor of two. Let's make it three to make sure it's better than existing attacks. And then, I mean, I know that a lot of crypto analysis would die, but I mean, isn't it like worth it? Or is a practical attack to be like totally uh, detrimental? No. You, you have that argument with the embedded device manufacturers. I see. I guess. We'll okay. see who wins. <laughs> I, I, would, I would like to take this opportunity to do some blatant PR for my next talk. I think it's on Thursday, yeah. uh, if I'm not mistaken. I'm going to talk about the SHA-3 competition. Mm. We had this wonderful discussion last week in Santa Barbara about SHA-3. And I think the, <laughs> the people who were there start laughing. You know, security costs a lot. Uh, Josh can tell you here, for example, that people are still using SHA-1 because SHA-2 is way too expensive. If you look at the performance figures, we're talking about not doubling the performance cost. Triple. Hmm? The software is triple. Okay, but... Oh, you, you want to hear a silly reason? I was trying to tell some people they shouldn't use MD5 for authenticating the API. And they said, oh, well, <coughs> we don't know of a good uh, SHA-236 implementation JavaScript, so we couldn't possibly you know, move that. <laughs> there are good uh, JavaScript implementations, but in any case, People don't want to pay for security. Now, what you pay is what you get. Is there, so the second thing, I'm not sure if it's practical or realistic, but is it possible? I know that sometimes, like, fine, yes, has like you know, 198 and 256 kind of variants, but I'm just wondering how practical is, you know, to require to at least somewhat parameterize, you know, a hash function, which blocks I've. Uh, uh, because sometimes there are a lot of choices which are completely ad hoc. You can say, okay, you know, I don't know, this is only like for whatever, 16 rounds or whatever is the right number, yes, it's 10. I'm just curious uh, how expensive it would be to force people to parameterize their designs, at least to envision this future attacks. So there was discussed in the yes competition quite a bit to, to have number of rounds, for example, as a negotiation in the SL negotiation. Ooh, it opens you up to attacks where I try and cheat the negotiation algorithm, make you believe you use 24 rounds and him believe you use 26 rounds. Yeah. And then I get a two round attack because I'm going to make you encrypt and him decrypt. And I get, and really, choosing number of rounds is so complicated. Farming it out to people who know even less is probably not a bad idea. Well, I, I'm not sure what I'm saying. You Look at the telephony situation. If you have uh, the uh, A50, A51, A52, etc., you just held about an attack in which you convince the other party to use the weak uh, version, and then you extract the key out of it. Yeah, I'm not saying about the policy which one to use a strong or the weak one, but at least also sometimes it's very hard when people put concrete constants, people say do run on a fast computer. If things are at least a little bit put in asymptotic notation for the attacks, uh, at least, you know, some simple, just a basic thing, like number of rounds, so key lengths. Uh, I think a lot of things would be, you know, a little bit more believable, and also people could be more or less impressed by a particular attack uh, by just seeing some formula, but I'm not sure. I'm, just... I'm in favor of your uh, suggestion, you know, to have a large margin of safety, but I'm trying to apply it to DES. When DES was designed, I think that uh, people didn't know 
uh, how to attack six rounds of uh, DES. Actually, there were papers uh, later on uh, showing how six rounds of DES could be broken. So, assuming that six was the number available, they would have uh, suggested 12 rounds. And then it would have been really nice to break uh, DES. No, but this is a great stuff. I, I mean, I think it's still kind of pretty much not broken, except for just, you know. So, I'm uh, pointing out that a factor of two might be uh, not sufficient in some cases, but certainly it's a good stuff. And other issues, the fact that besides issues where you try to negotiate things, the people who do implementations, if you look at SSL, you can say, listen, SSL was not designed in crypto agility. I think this was the name they were trying to push at some point. That you would be able to change, you know, why, sh why are we stuck with MD5 when, you know, the protocol should allow you to change the hash function to something else in the future. But IETF works in such a way that SSL, you have to, ma the handshake tells you, I'm going to use MD5 with AES with, and when AES came into, into existence and it, when it was selected as a standard, they had to double all the number of parameters from stop working with triple death, start working with AES. That, that's an argument that we lost. I mean, but, but that, that's, that's the problem here. People who do implementations have, are more likely to screw up these things then they are to screw up. Here is a black box that does AES. Use it. Period. Here are the test vectors. If you do not conform to these test vectors, you're dead. The, the fact is that we know how to build block ciphers better than we know how to build protocols. Still, this is the case. So why to, to push the problems to where we don't know how to solve the problem, rather than, to, you know, let's keep it in block ciphers, double the number of rounds, I agree. But the problem is that if you try to parameterize things, you generate a problem to the protocol people, you know, key exchange is still not solved. So you want to throw in some, okay, and now we agree on the number of rounds. Yeah. I'd also point out that in practice, of all the digital fraud going on, I don't remember hearing of a single one which actually used script analysis, right? Web. It's never the weak point, even this Web. stuff. Why would you bother doing this if you can steal your money the other way? Web. So we're actually doing a pretty good job as cryptographers. Web. <laughs> Web. Web, web, and web. But, but some One of, single attack that actually crypto analysis matters yes. in real life. Some of the web. best attacks against web were really involved protocol and things that weren't really web. It yeah, but I mean, but there was not a there was not a bug in the cipher. Right? It's not bug. Well, the cipher has issues. Yeah. Yeah. Let's start with the fact that the cipher has issues. But if you put this aside, the problem is the fact that they put the IV here and not there. And actually, there is a paper by Mantin from Asia Crypto Five that if you put the IV here and not there, or there and not here where everybody believed it was okay, you can still attack it. So we still have issues with the fact that it's RC4 in this specific mode with 24 bit of, of IV and that and that many bits of key. But there, there is one attack where the crypto actually is the source of the problems. Now, of course, if you select weak passwords or you know the protocol is still not using RC4 correctly, we're screwed, but I mean. But even that, people did this attack, but I haven't really heard of people like robbing the bank or stealing money by, by attacking the web. Actually, I think that the TJ Maxx yes. credit card fraud. Yes. fraud. They actually lost a billion dollars. Yes, yes. Okay. So, but I think you're right. Woo. Don't we have an example. Oh, wow. <laughs> but it's worth a lot. <laughs> For 40, 45 million credit, cards number, credit card numbers, you know, I'm willing to say this is a good example. I don't know, it was 40, 45? Now on J for 20 years, something by the name of Gonzalez. He stole a billion dollars? No, it cost TJ Maxx ah. went to refund banks and uh, they were changing uh, okay. tens of millions of credit cards. Yeah. Out the bottle, the not, not, the, not the amount stolen. The amount stolen was much smaller, but it cost TJ Maxx a billion dollars. What's the reference? I missed it. Just so that Look for TJ Maxx, uh, Etec, Gonzalez, and, credit card. Uh, fine, credit card. Uh, there was uh, a guy who was uh, uh, sitting next to a uh, kind of operating center of TJ Maxx in uh, Massachusetts, not far from Boston, and he, uh, they were moving all the credit card information by uh, Wi Fi uh, using the protection available. The web and uh, he wrote well, using uh, he didn't invent that tech but he was implementing uh, that tech and using it and uh, that's how he got 45 million credit card numbers. 
the point of sale, the point of sale devices were just transmitting uh, the credit card. I think actually took uh, post card I'm curious. <laughs> I see, but um, interestingly, it's actually it's a policy question. You're saying TG Maxx had to pay for all of it because they kind of took something off the shelf. Right? Yeah. They didn't. They had to pay yeah. the Visa has very strict policies that if you deal with credit card numbers, you have to follow these guidelines. And I assume TG Maxx wasn't following the guidelines. And well, Visa would have told them, listen, we're not going to deal with you anymore. Like, would you like to go to TJ Maxx store and say, well, sorry, sir, we don't accept a Visa, only MasterCard. And also MasterCard was affected, and American Express, and I think so nobody would work with them. Um, bling, uh, please bring your cash with you. Uh, and they don't like cash because then the staff makes it disappear. Yeah. So, OK. Thank you. Thank you.